This week, I've considered the problems of dimensions of spans, determination of linear independence of a set of vectors, determination of a basis for a span, and writing vectors in terms of a new basis. All these problems were solved by row reducing a matrix, one way or another, where the initial vectors were either used as rows or columns for the matrix. The material so far has been about spans and linear combinations. Spans were one of the two ways to produce linear objects. The other was loci. Loci were formed by taking some number of linear equations and asking for all the points that satisfy all of the equations simultaneously. What is the dimension of a locus? Is there an algorithmic way to calculate this as well? For a span, the dimension was the rank of a matrix, the matrix formed by taking the spanning vectors and inputting them as rows of a matrix. For a locus, I would like a matrix solution as well. And happily there is one, and even better, we've actually already done all of this work. A locus is the geometric interpretation of a system of equations. Last week, I used matrices to solve systems of equations. All of that was calculating loci. Loci are systems of equations, just thought of geometrically instead of algebraically. The locus is just the solution space of the system. I talked about the dimension of solution spaces last week. The dimension of the solution space is the number of free variables. In terms of the matrix, this is the number of total variables minus the rank, since each leading one is a variable column that is not a free variable. Consider one of last week's examples. Here is a system of two equations in four variables. I put this system into a matrix as I did last week. I row reduce that matrix to produce this. The variables y and z are free here, since they are in columns that don't have leading ones. Then I take this and I write the solution in terms of the parameters. I'll skip the steps that I showed last week, but the end solution written as a vector is this y and z are free parameters, and since y and z are free, the second part of this equation is just a linear combination of the two vectors. That's just a span, so I can actually write this as an offset span. So what does it mean to solve a system? Well, from this perspective, solving a system means taking a locus and writing it as an offset span. There is a geometric object, some affine subspace, described by the locus. Solving the system is changing my description of the affine subspace, writing it as an offset span instead of as a locus. Same geometric object, different description. This raises an interesting thought. I am solving a system of equations, but geometrically I am just changing my description from a locus to a span. Is this really solving? This is actually a deep and important question in mathematics. What does it really mean to solve something? You can certainly argue that solving is just changing the description of something, going from a perhaps more difficult description to an easier or more explicit description. Consider these two equations. Solving to go from the first to the second is some kind of early algebra problem, probably done some, sometime in maybe junior high school. But looking at this mathematically, both of these equations are descriptions of a number. The first says, the number which, when multiplied by 5 and then added to 4, produces 19. And the second says, more explicitly, the number 3. But they are both descriptions. Solving is moving from one description to another, where the second description is more helpful, more convenient, more explicit. This means that in solving, there is a judgment call. Which description is better, locus or span, algebraic equation or explicit number? It's not necessarily clear-cut. In many contexts, what it means to solve depends on a judgment what kind of descriptions of mathematical things you happen to like in a moment. It's not necessarily easy and clear-cut. Even the idea of solving, a core idea in mathematics, is not quite as straightforward as it might seem. Anyway, let me finish with one more thought now about loci. 
Determining the dimension of a locus is counting the free variables, or taking the total variables and subtracting the rank of the matrix. For spans, dimension was an issue of redundancy, which vectors are not needed in the span. For loci, there is a redundancy as well. Not all equations might be necessary. In the matrix for a system of equations, each row corresponds to an equation. In the reduced form of the matrix, if there is a row of all zeros, then the equation that originally corresponded to that row, keeping track of row exchanges, was a redundant equation. It can be removed without changing the locus. The necessary equations are those equations that lead to rows with leading ones in the matrix. This is also a path to the dimension of a locus. If a locus has no redundant equations, then each equation is a real restriction. Each equation, as a real restriction, drops the dimension by one. Therefore, the dimension is the starting ambient dimension, the n in the Rn I start in, minus the number of equations. With no redundant equations, a locus of three equations in R5 has dimension two, since five minus three is two.